My name is Elwin Berlekamp. This is my 11th G4G, but the first at which I'm going to give a talk that has no new results. Uh, instead, I'm going to present a rehearsal of an abbreviated version of a video I'm going to make to extend our outreach by exposing a small portion of the mathematics behind a popular children's game. Uh, this game is called Dots and Boxes. Here's the initial position of a 25 box game. Uh, when it's all done, the board will be divided up into 25 squares, <clears throat> and each player will have claimed some squares, and whoever claims the most squares wins the game. So let's look at a particular game. <clears throat> uh, this was a game between uh, two players called Arthur and Bertha. Arthur will have a pen which on the outside is red, Bertha's pen on the outside is blue, but both pens have black ink. So the only, you can see who's making moves, but the moves all, once they're made, they look the same. Uh, so Arthur makes a move, Bertha makes a response, and we start a few moves go along here. Uh, after a while, uh, everybody just plays wherever they want, but eventually we get to a position here where Bertha is making the third side of a box, see? Now this allows Arthur, in his turn, <clears throat> to complete that box, and when you play the fourth side of a box, you claim that box, put your initial in it, and then you must take an extra move. This is called a complementary move, which you get as a bonus for having made a box, uh, or more boxes, but as long as you make boxes, you continue to make moves. If you make a move that doesn't make a box, then your turn is over. So he takes that second box, and then he makes a move which completes his turn, and then we're done. Uh, but the game, we alternating moves resume. Uh, <clears throat> I learned <clears throat> this game <clears throat> in 1946 when I was in the first grade, and it was popular. And I still see it played fairly often, uh, particularly at airports. You often see couples spending their time playing this game or sometimes on airplanes. This game has now gotten to a point where Bertha is making a third side of yet another box. Uh, and Arthur takes that box and gets an extra turn and the play continues uh, till we soon get to a point where there's nowhere you can play that doesn't offer the other opponent in the box. And the board's now partitioned into strings. These strings are also called chains. You can see the chains here. There's a chain of length one, there's a chain of length six, there's another chain of length six, there's another chain of length seven, there's a chain of length two, and that's all together the chains have lengths one, six, six, seven, and two. That sort of characterizes what's left. Uh, <clears throat> and it's Arthur's turn, and he's got to give away a chain. He happens to pick to give away the chain of length six. Now, it seems like a strange move. Why couldn't he give away the chain of length one? Well, it turns out, <clears throat> actually, when you understand this game, it doesn't matter what he does. He's lost. This game is pretty much over, uh, and all of his moves are about equally bad. But he tries that one. So Bertha now starts taking boxes, but see, each box she makes, she gets an extra turn, and she keeps doing this until she's taken all but two boxes of that chain. And now uh, she could finish and take the last two boxes of chain, but if she does, then it's still her turn. She's got to start opening a new chain. But rather than do that, she finds the only winning move on the board, which is this brilliant move up here, which avoids making any more boxes and therefore completes her turn. It's then Arthur's turn, he gets to take those two boxes, but the rules say he gets only one extra move, he, even though he made two boxes on one move. So he now has to start giving another chain. So he picks the chain of length one now, which Bertha takes. Uh, Bertha then gives back the chain of length two, and Arthur gets those, but then he's gotta give some more boxes to Bertha. He opens that chain, and Bertha cleans that up pretty much. But when she gets to the end, she again realizes if she took those two boxes, then she has to give that whole chain of length seven away and then she loses the game. So she doesn't do that. She just gets rid of her turn by playing up there and making a domino instead of a box. And that leaves Arthur with another double cross, so-called double crossing move, because it's a cross that makes two boxes on one turn. And then he has to give the last chain to Bertha, which Bertha quickly cleans up and that's that. She gets all that. And she wins the game by a score of 16 to nine. Uh, now, uh, there's lots of, lots of strategies about this game and quite a bit of mathematics behind it that is explained in my book, uh, which is 
one of the least expensive books out there. You can buy it. At, uh, and I'll be signing it this afternoon if you, uh, for whoever I managed to sell this to. Uh, now I'll just say a little bit more about what, what is this game really all about? It turns out people get so distracted by the score, <clears throat> which is a very short range objective. The key really to this game is the parity of the number of long chains. One player is trying to get an even number of long chains, the other try to, trying to get an odd number of long chains. And once you understand this, you move up to a higher level. It turns out this, is a, this game is remarkable in that the players can be partitioned into at least four or five different leagues. And I watch a game in an airport, and they're either, maybe they're playing at level zero, which means they haven't even figured out yet that sometimes it's a good idea not to take all the boxes you can. So greedy players are rookies, and they play at level zero. And then we get to level one, where players understand sometimes you don't want to take all the boxes. And once they get, players rarely get past that. But if they do, they, they find, they, they discover the first theorem, which is hard to see, but easy to prove. And the theorem says that, sorry, I'm going the wrong way here. It's a parity of the long chains account. And so who controls the number of long chains depends on how many long chains there are. Uh, and from, with that insight, under fairly reasonable assumptions that frequently apply, we go back and we look at this move which is a sacrifice, and most people, most beginners think, gee, why is she giving away a box? Turns out that's the best move on the board at this point. Uh, it's the only move that ensures there will be three long chains altogether, not four. Uh, if she doesn't play in that three square over there in the east, Arthur will be able to make a long chain there, and then he'll have one chain in the far east, one chain in the near east, one chain up in the top center, and eventually somebody's gonna make a chain in the west. Either player can do that. That's a bit harder to see, but that's the way it is. And there are yet more theorems. So this, this game has a lot of mathematics behind it. And I urge you to buy my book and learn it. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen.